Good morning, church, and welcome to the sanctuary of First Presbyterian Church in Evansville, Indiana. We're delighted that you have joined us this morning. If you haven't already done so, take a moment and sign in on the comment box so that we can know that you are with us. And uh, why not also put on that where you're watching from this morning? We've been amazed at how many people beyond the immediate tri-state area have been joining us for online worship. So if you wouldn't mind telling us where you are this morning, that will add to our celebration as well. A few announcements, a couple of reminders about things. Throughout the week ahead, beginning tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock, we enter into the information gathering phase of reopening. And we have sent out a video to our members and friends and invited you to be part of a Zoom meeting sometime this week. That list of meetings was listed again in Friday's Connect. We hope that you will join us for conversation. So if you have not already responded, please send me an email today, and that will allow me to get you an invitation to one of those meetings tomorrow. You pick the meeting, I'll send the invitation. Remember my email address is kevin at firstpresevansville.com. I'll send those invitations out tomorrow morning. Tomorrow evening at 6.30 on the CAGE page of Facebook, Congregations Acting for Justice and Empowerment, we have the annual Nehemiah Action, but this year in a virtual form. So tomorrow evening at 6.30, I hope you'll wander over to CAGE's Facebook page and be a part of hearing all of the reports from the investigative committees and comments from our civic and community leaders, and just a time to be together to raise up the needs of our community. So join us tomorrow night at 6.30. On Wednesday at 5.30, we will join together for a service of evening prayer from the sanctuary. Hope you'll join us then. And on Thursday at noon, Rob will be back to provide music for an organ recital at 12 noon on Thursday here on the Facebook page. This is the Sunday of the church year when we typically would celebrate and recognize our church musicians. Of all the things that I am missing about us being together, the gift of our choir and handbells and flutes, I, I miss the most. So I hope that you will join me in thanking them for their service this year. I will simply read their names to you. Michelle Fourche. Michael Garrison, Joe Frobiter Muller, Joe Waller, Katie Marino, Greta Griffin, Kathleen Weston, Laura Blaylock, Mike Brown, Andy Hubbard, Peter Unger, Abby Greenwell, Samuel Wolf, Oliver Hubbard, Elena Nichols, Paul Blaylock, Mark Fox, Joanna Fleming, Carrie Norvell, Micaiah Franz, Lynn Thyssen, Nick Kornberger, Amelie Hubbard, Tom Thornton, Jane Bernhardt, Dick Bernhardt, Nancy Irwin, Sidney Wathen, Maddie Singleton, William Nichols, Sue Korb, Leslie Roberts, Andrew Singleton, Nell Clay, Elizabeth Becker, Larry Miller, Lucy Martindale, Sarah Pierce, Mike Wolf, Georgia Shaw Pullen. We are grateful to all of them and all those who have joined us throughout the year to provide music. We are blessed by your efforts. I also want to take the opportunity to thank Mark Fox and Robert Nichols, especially for their leadership in all of our music programming. It is a great gift to us, and we are blessed to have them as music leaders as well. So the time has come to begin worship. Will you join me in the call to worship? Like a mother hen brooding over her chicks, protecting them from the storm, God's protecting presence surrounds us. Like a teacher, God smiles and says, try again. Like a mother who comforts a hurting child, God kisses away all our hurts. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, 
God is faithful still. With joy and gladness, let us worship God. I invite you to join in singing there in your home. Sing loud as you want. Make a joyful noise. Christ is risen, shout Hosanna, celebrate this day of days. Christ is risen, hush in wonder, all creation is amazed. In the desert, all surrounding, see a spreading tree hath grown. Healing leaves of grace abounding, Bring a taste of love unknown. Christ is risen, raise your spirits from the caverns of despair. Walk with gladness in the morning, see what love can do and dare. Drink the wine of resurrection, not a servant, but a friend. Jesus is our strong companion, joy and peace shall never end. Christ is risen, earth and heaven, never more shall be the same. Break the bread of new creation, where the world is still in pain. Tell its grim demonic chorus, Christ is risen, get you gone. God the first and the last is with us, sing Hosanna every Let us pray. Even when you're not here, sometimes things are different. That's Robert's second mistake for this year. He will be permitted no others. Will you join me in the opening prayer? O God, in whose womb the universe was conceived and nurtured, and from which all creation was birthed, we give you thanks and celebrate your fostering presence. You have brought us to this day of celebration and worship. You have nourished us with your body and blood. You have dried our tears and bound up our wounds. You have provided for us in every way. With thanksgiving and gratitude, we come before you to offer our worship. Receive our praise and devotion. Amen. The second act of worship is always listening for the word of life. So as we open the pages of scripture, let us pray that God will speak to us and call us to new discipleship and service. Mothering God, open our hearts, our minds, our eyes, our ears, our hands. Make us fully receptive to the word you give. Admonish us where we need correction Encourage us where we need support. Be present, we pray. Amen. The first lesson is a responsive reading that's taken from Psalm 104. I invite you to join me in proclaiming these words of celebration. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your greatness. Yonder is the great and wide sea, with its living things too many to number, creatures both small and great. There move the ships, and there is that Leviathan, which you have made for the sport of it. All of them look to you, to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it, you open your hand, and they are filled with good things." 
You hide your face, and they are terrified. You take away their breath, and they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, and they are created, and so you renew the face of the earth. May your glory, O Lord, endure forever. May you rejoice in all your works. You look at the earth, and it trembles. You touch the mountains, and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. Uh, Rob was playing, I was taking a look, and we have people from New York to California to Boonville joining us this morning. What a joy. Thank you all for being a part of our worship today. In honor of Mother's Day, I wore my mother's hair this morning. I am desperately in need of a haircut. Forgive my somewhat poofy hair. Um, I'm referring to it as a Presbyterian pompadour. Our second lesson for the morning is taken from the very end of the collection of the Proverbs. We're in chapter 31, verses 10 through 31. A worthy woman who can find. Her price is far beyond rubies. The heart of her husband trusts her, and no prize does he lack. She repays him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks out wool and flax and performs with willing hands. She is like merchant ships. From afar, she brings her bread. She gets up while it is still night and provides nourishment for her house and a portion for her young women. She sets her mind on a field and buys it. From the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds her loins in strength and gives power to her arms. She understands that her wares are good. 
Her lamp does not go out at night. Her hands she reaches out to the distaff, and her palms hold on to the spindle. Her palms she opens to the poor, and her hand she extends to the wretched. She does not fear for her household because of snow, for her whole household is clothed in scarlet. Covers she makes for herself, linen and purple her garments. Her husband is famed in the gates when he sits with the land's elders. Fine cloth she makes and she sells it, a loincloth she gives to the trader. Strength and grandeur are her garment and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth in wisdom. The teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks after the ways of her house and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her sons rise up and call her happy. Her husband, he praises her. Many daughters have done worthy things, but you, you surpass them all. Grace is a lie and beauty merely breath. A Lord-fearing woman, it is she who is praised. Give her from the fruit of her hands and let her deeds praise her in the gates. Glory be to God who gives us the word. May God write that word on our hearts and may God and God alone receive glory, honor, and praise. There is as much danger in the preparation and delivery of a Mother's Day sermon as there was for that man who walked the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho. As a general rule, I try to steer clear of overtly Mother's Day messages, but with the chaos of this year, it seems the right thing to do. But the simple truth is that it is a journey that is fraught with danger. First, most Mother Day's sermon devolve into a syrupy sentimentality devoid of the good news of the gospel, and that serves no good purpose. I have been present for such sermons where people either contracted some form of diabetes during the sermon or had to reach for their insulin in order to get through it. I will not be a part of that. Second, most Mother's Day sermons end up reinforcing the same stereotypic sex role garbage that has gone on for too long. In no small way, supported by the most misogynistic passages from Scripture and the worst of the human Christian tradition, too many sermons praise motherhood as the ultimate expression of what it means to be a woman and reinforces the diminishment of women to the domain of the home. I will not be a part of that either. Third, most Mother's Day sermons ignore a pastoral sensitivity that is critical to preaching. As a pastor, I must be aware that there are those whose relationship with their mother was not good and that this day brings no joy. I must also be aware that there are many women who longed to be a mother and for whom that never came to pass. I must also remember that there are mothers whose children have died and that for them, this is a bittersweet day. And I must remember that there are children who are mourning the passing of a mother they dearly loved and that this is a tender time. And on top of all of that, I must remember that there are those children who have walked away from their mothers for a variety of reasons. Therefore, I reiterate the obvious. I am traveling a dangerous road this morning. So how to proceed? It occurs to me that we should take a look at the wisdom lessons of the book of Proverbs. Fair warning, I plan on preaching from the book of Proverbs for the summer months, so consider this a preview of coming attractions. The book of Proverbs is, quite frankly, an editor's nightmare. Most of the book is comprised of little sayings that read like the little slips you get out of a fortune cookie. They're pithy and to the point, memorable and even humorous. There are themes that can be discerned, 
but the organization is at first blush haphazard and disorderly. But there are two significant characters that emerge from the pages of Proverbs. One is Lady Wisdom. The other is Lady Folly. The way of God is embodied in the way of Lady Wisdom. The way that ignores God's way is characterized by Lady Folly. Yes, there are elements of sexism in the descriptions. Why use women? Why not men? There are some disparaging comments about women sprinkled through the book, and they are not worthy of sermonic treatment. All of this back and forth between Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly comes to a conclusion at the very end of the book. A worthy woman who can find. The passage is an acrostic poem based on the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and it offers us an image of what it means to incorporate all of Lady Wisdom's way into a human life. The characteristics are powerful. She is industrious and does not eat the bread of idleness. She does good for her husband, her family, and for all she knows. She provides for her household, including her servant girls, and her people never knew deprivation or destitution. She is admired by all who know her, and her ways are true and good. And there is where I found this sermon. In my 60 years of knowing conscious involvement in the Christian church, I have known so, so many of these women. Far too many of them were nearly invisible. They did not seek the limelight. They did not work for glory or praise. They did not expect acknowledgement or accolade. Still, they were the heart, soul, mind, and strength of the congregations they served. They taught the Sunday school classes. They sponsored the bazaars and strawberry festivals that enabled them to bail out the church when the church's funds ran low. They assembled newsletters, cooked meals, painted classrooms, and sponsored missionaries. They prepared meals for grieving families and took food to the houses of the elderly. They quilted phenomenal works of art and received a pittance for their labor, which they added to the church's coffers. They sang in the choir and prepared communion. The list goes on and on. I remember clearly when the first woman was elected as a ruling elder in the church of my childhood. It was scandalous. A woman being ordained and taking a seat on the session. I remember the day of her ordination when a good many of the male elders refused to come forward for the laying on of hands. I remember her courage in boldly answering the questions, kneeling for ordination, and being installed as an elder on a board that was not really sure she belonged there. I remember them. These industrious, committed, self-sacrificing servants of Jesus Christ. I remember the women who held the church together and prevented schism in the face of incredible pastoral malpractice. I remember the women who were denied the opportunity to use their God-given leadership gifts. I remember the women who, even though serving as pastors, were the targets of slander and gossip and the most abominable treatment that would have never been leveled had they been male. I remember the women in ministry who had to put up with the flirtive glances and double entendre from lecherous men in their congregations. And I remember the extraordinarily qualified women who never got the call to minister in a larger congregation because they had been born with an X chromosome instead of a Y. I remember them. I can see their faces. In some cases, I can still hear their voices. I remember their commitment, their creativity, their imagination, 
their love. I remember their industry and the honor they brought to their Lord and the church. I remember them. And I am fully aware of how each of them shaped my faith and my ministry to this very day. I celebrate their gifts. I celebrate their determination. I celebrate their never say never attitude and their, for want of a better word, persistence. And here is where I want you to preach with me. I want you to stir the waters of your memory and call to mind the women you have known who have taken their discipleship and service with a seriousness that inspires. I invite you to enter into a moment of remembering, of calling up their names and faces and their voices if you can. I encourage you to think of an example or what two or three that quickened a new sense of faith and commitment that they offered you. Now, as they come to mind, type their name in the comment box on this page, won't you please? If you're not comfortable offering their whole name, just offer their first name. But let their names be remembered. Three, two, one, go. We are here today because they were there yesterday. We are who we are today because they helped shape us in those formative moments. We are the beneficiaries of their industry and commitment, work and prayer. We are who we are because they were who they were. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands, let her works praise her in the city gates. For all those women whose faith inspires for all those women whose work lives on, for all those women who taught and teach the faith to others, for all those women who ensured and ensure the mission of the church, for all those women who kept and keep the church alive, for all those women whose persistence enabled and enables us to hear the Spirit calling forth something new, for all those women who were and are ignored by the church, for all those women who were and are disregarded, for all those women who made us and make us who we are, May they be praised, and may we be like them, for now and evermore. Amen. As God's people, let us affirm our faith with words taken from a brief statement of faith, one of the confessions of the Presbyterian Church USA. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and creates everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people to live as one community. But we rebel against God we hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, 
exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation. Yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Again, in what would be our time of a morning offering, I want to thank you again for your faithfulness, your generosity, for some of you even going a second mile to provide the financial support to our ministry and mission even during this time of isolation. Our work goes on. I applied for, on your behalf, a grant from the Presbytery of Ohio Valley for funds from the Monroe City Fund, which is to be used for feeding ministries. Uh, we received a full grant of $2,000, which will be going to the Tri-State Food Bank to further enable them to help feed the hungry of our area. The, real out, the reality of hunger and the need for food is profound. And so I hope you will continue to hold the work of Tri-State Food Bank in your hearts as we move through these days. And we are grateful for our partners at Presbytery for seeing the value in what Tri-State is doing and enabling us to further our commitment to them. As we prepare to come to God in prayer, I invite you to begin submitting prayer requests if you've not already done so. Jerusalem is going to put together a list of those requests. And as they come in, we continue something of a Mother's Day tradition here at First Presbyterian Church. Many years back, I read to you a poem by the former poet laureate of the United States, Billy Collins. It's entitled, The Lanyard. It's become something of a tradition here. So hear the words once again. The other day I was ricocheting slowly off the blue walls of this room, bouncing from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, when I found myself in the L section of the dictionary, where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one more suddenly into the past, a past where I sat at a workbench, at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake, learning how to braid thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never, one, never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one, if that's what you did with them, but that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts, and I gave her a lanyard. She nursed me in many a sick room, lifted teaspoons of medicine to my lips, set cold face cloths on my forehead, then led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim, and I in turn presented her with a lanyard. Here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing and a good education, and here is your lanyard, I replied, which I made with a little help from a counselor. Here is a breathing body and a beating heart, strong legs, bones, and teeth, and two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here, I said, is the lanyard I made at camp. And here, I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift, not the archaic truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hands, I was as sure as a boy can be that this useless thing I had worn out, woven out of boredom 
would be enough to make us even. So now we come to our time for prayer. Among the concerns for prayers today, for scientists who are seeking to understand COVID-19 and developing a a vaccine. Let's go to God in prayer. Caring, compassionate, loving God, we give you thanks for this day, for the joy that is ours in the sunshine, the blooms and blossoms, the trees and grass, the reemergence of life that surrounds us in this springtime. We are grateful for the love that surrounds us, a love that begins in you and is channeled through others to us. We give you thanks for your goodness, your faithfulness, your love. We remember before you today the women who have made us who we are. For biological mothers and spiritual mothers who have shaped us and formed us into the people we are. For teachers, professors, mentors who have gifted us with understanding. For sisters in the faith by whose example we learn what discipleship is all about. We remember today those for whom this will be a difficult day. We remember those who mourn a mother's passing. We remember those who are filled with regret that the relationship between mother and child was not what it should be. We remember those who will be heartbroken today because their children have walked away. We remember those who mourn the possibilities lost to serve as a mother God, in the mixture of joy and sorrow that is in the very nature of this day, we pray your presence. Bring peace. Bring wholeness. Bring celebration. Bring comfort. We pray for all those who have been affected by COVID-19 for those who are still struggling with the virus in hospitals and at home. We pray for doctors and nurses and medical technicians, for scientists and researchers who are seeking to understand the virus and develop effective treatments and long-lasting vaccines. We pray for those who are doing their very best to keep distance, to wear masks, to wash hands. And we pray for those who simply do not care to be of help to anyone by ignoring the warnings and pleading some ridiculous sense of personal rights. Oh God, teach us to work together, caring for the least, the most vulnerable, the most at risk. Teach us the seriousness of the virus. Remind us of the over 70,000 of our country folk who have died from the virus and the over 1 million who have been infected. Help us to do our part not because of some governmental dictate, but because we are the children of God who are called to love our neighbor as ourself.
We pray for students and teachers who are coming into the final days of a very strange school year. We pray for seniors who expected proms and graduations and who will receive none of it. May we celebrate their achievements all the same. We pray for leaders that they will be open to the truth of science, that they will put away the partisanship that is growing within a pandemic, that we will be well served by those we have elected. Finally, O oh God, we pray for ourselves. Hear the prayers we offer from our hearts. These and all our prayers we offer in the name of Jesus, risen and living, who still teaches his disciples to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll conclude by singing. I hope you'll join us there at home. of our mothers living yet in cradle song and bedtime prayer in nursery love and fireside love thy presence still pervades the air faith of our mothers living of our mother's lavish faith, the fount of childhood's trust and grace. Oh, may thy consecration prove the wellspring of a nobler race. Faith of our mother's lavish faith, of our mother's guiding faith for youthful longing youthful doubt how blurred our vision blind our way thy providential care without faith of our mother's guiding
Call them up again today, won't you? Call them up in your memory, these amazing women who have shaped us as disciples of Jesus Christ. Remember the teachers, the preachers, the women who did the thankless jobs, the invisible ones. Bring them to memory. Let them live again and celebrate all that they have done. Let them be praised in the city gates and let God's people give thanks for each and every one. Now, enjoy the day, and may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen.